Hello and welcome everyone to this talk presented by the UK section of the Audio Engineering Society. Um, if you're not a member of the AES, um, then I would strongly encourage you, as audio is obviously an interest to you, to consider joining us. We are more than 14,000 members organised across the world into more than 75 professional sections and 95 student sections. And we are the largest professional body worldwide representing all aspects of audio engineering. Our members cover everything from live sound and studio music production all the way through um, manufacture of equipment, the gear we use, the software, the hardware, the transducers, uh, all the way through to acoustics and psychoacoustics. Uh, and of course, education in all of the above. So if audio is your thing, please do consider joining us if you haven't done already. Um, our talk today is entitled Good Vibrations, Past, Present and the Future of Analog Musical Oscillators. And it reminded me uh, of a, a documentary that was on a BBC Radio 4 some years ago about an instrument called the Ondioline. And I looked it up just out of interest because we were going to be hearing much more about that sort of thing tonight. And on Google Arts and Culture, it describes it as a small electronic instrument with touch keypad, knee operated volume control, yada, 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 and with floppy disk, which is quite remarkable for 1942. Um, and just goes to show that Google can't even conceive of a purely analog world. But no such problem at all for our speaker today, who is Dr. Neil Johnson. Uh, Neil is a senior software engineer at Roku Europe, uh, where he's involved in developing multimedia consumer products, things like streaming sticks and soundbars, all the way through to smart TVs. And Neil received his BSc and MEng from uh, the University of Surrey and a PhD from the University of Cambridge in computer science. Uh, and he's a chartered engineer, IET member, senior IEEE member, and of course, not only a member of the AES, but he is our UK section chair this year. Uh, and his interests include uh, not only low level systems involving hardware and software, uh, the design of uh, and development of electronic music synthesizers, uh, encompassing analog, digital, and MIDI technologies. But he's also the founder of a thing called CZYG. I'm not sure whether I pronounced that correctly, Neil, C-E-S-Y-G, which is a yeah, project yeah. and, I believe, a limited company which develops novel electronic musical instruments uh, for research and progressing the art. So, Neil, over to you. Good vibrations, the past, the present, and the future of analog musical oscillators. Thank you very much for the intro, Mike. Um... I think some very kind words I don't yet deserve, but hopefully this evening's talk will uh, at least be um, cover some interesting topics that uh, um, are worth talking about. So, good vibrations, past, present, and future of musical of analog analog musical oscillators. So let's go back in time. We don't have a TARDIS, but we've got a PowerPoint. Um, to all whom it may concern, be it known that I, Thaddeus Cahill, have invented a new and useful art of and apparatus for generating and distributing music electrically. That was from a patent in 1897 and technology that had been developed um, several years before that, because of course the process of, de of writing and filing patents. So we can go right back to the late 1800s uh, for, um, using electronics uh, to generate um, audio, audio music. So the ancient ones, and as I said, here's um, it, whether it started with Carl Hill, but he's certainly one of the most well-known of the uh, developers of the art in uh, electronic uh, music. And he's, his, his main contribution was, was this telharmonium, which uh, you had an operator sitting at a keyboard and played music over the this newfangled thing called the telephone, and you could dial in and listen to live music. Speeding on into uh, so still staying with uh, the tra tra traditional polyphonic uh, musical keyboard, um, we have uh, Hammond's tone wheels, and for those who don't know how this works. We have lots of little gear wheels with teeth on them, um, spin them around all at the same speed. I think originally they used vacuum cleaner motors. Um, and at the right rotation, the number of teeth would give you a pitch. So you have lots and lots of teeth, lots and lots uh, of gear wheels, lots of a little uh, guitar pickup like things, and you can make um, 
an electronic uh, organ type keyboard and, and home organs were a very very big thing when uh, th these tone wheel organs were coming out at around the same time um there was lots of scrap aluminium this is after world war ii lots of scrap aluminium so um roads developed the their um their own electronic um e electromechanical uh instrument and they used uh aluminium tines you hit them with a um a keyboard mechanism and they make a nice sound amplify it and you've got a home keyboard on the cheap but things also got electronic um and going back a little bit back in 1928 or thereabouts um martineau in france developed this instrument called the ondes martineau and for anyone who's uh, listened to uh, or watched um, the works of um, Jerry Anderson, uh, Thunderbirds, uh, Space 1999, or, and all that kind of thing, will be familiar with the sound of the Ondes Martineau, as Barry Gray was a, uh, a keen user of this um, very esoteric instrument. And to my knowledge, I don't think there's anything has come um, anywhere near replacing this. Um, it's a very interactive instrument, and if you're if you want to know more, just as as Mike said earlier, use Google. Google answers everything. And uh, around the similar time, um, a Russian uh, engineer by, by the name of uh, Leon Chermin, my Russian pronunciation is terrible, um, discovered that if you wave your hand around um, a, an RF oscillator, in, in those days they were very much valve-based, uh, you could change its frequency a little bit. So then when you have two oscillators, one that changes frequency a bit and, and one that doesn't, you can generate a beat frequency and that can be in the audio range. And of course, the first, one of the first things he did was make a box that makes wibbly wobbly sounds. That's what engineers do. So pushing further the uh, electronic um, generation of tones, in the 1950s, you had organ companies like Kinsman using neon tubes. Now these were being used to, both as oscillators um there a neon tube for those who don't know um if you apply an increasing voltage at some point it will break down and uh discharge a capacitor and then you can keep doing that not only did they use it for generating tones but you can also use the neon tubes for generating dividers and so you have 12 oscillators giving you your top octaves and then you divide down for the other octaves and then as the Cost of transistors came down, or uh, companies like Wurlitzer developed um, home organs, again, very much the main market at the time. Um, home organs, again, using the high frequency oscillators for the top 12 notes, and then dividing down for, for home organs using transistors. Now, as I said, this is very much the um, home organ market, it was a massive, massive market for. Um, electrical and electronic musical instruments at the time because everybody um, entertained themselves at home, they would learn to play the organ, sit around and play tunes for themselves and their families. But at the same time, um, other types of sound were starting to come into play. And these were the wibbly wobbly burbly whoop, whoop sounds. To begin with, they took a lot of effort to make. Here's an example is Delia Derbyshire in the or Derbyshire in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, creating the kind of music that we uh, came to know as the BBC uh, as the Doctor Who theme tune. That was created with um, lab equipment, uh, bench oscillators, um, tape recorders, mixing desks. Very, very intensive, very hard work. Um, but clearly, there was a market for this. And then in the 1950s, going back a little bit, an American teenager started building theremins, um, a growing market for electronic music sounds, and he got a taste for these weird electronic sounds. Fast forward a few years, and the company that he founded, uh, named after him, started selling these modular synthesizers. And here's a an, an example, this is in 1975, mode modular 55. And a few years later, this teenager grew up and made a few more 
synthesizers because they're cool and fun and make wonderful sounds. So let's start focusing on what we really mean by oscillators. So I sort of classify oscillators in as two types. The earlier types that we talked about, the resonators, that they were um, especially in the guise of the uh, the roads. Um, it's a tuning fork. Um, it's an oscillator which oscillates at one frequency. Uh, it's stable. Um, it's small and cheap, so you can have many of them. And this gave rise to the, the organ technology. You have a lot of cheap oscillators, but they're fixed, and it's difficult to change their pitch. Um, you could do this a bit on uh, um, the cannons by turning the uh, the power to the motor on and off, and it would slow down, give you a bit of a shift, but that wasn't really recommended. Um, on the other hand, we've got these, what I call cyclical oscillators, where you have some sort of charging or discharging mechanism going on, then you reach a threshold, a switch kicks in, resets this electronic circuit back to starting point, and the whole thing um, goes round and round and round, and oscillates. Um, they have a wide frequency range, easily a 1,000 to 1, which is what you want for uh, to cover um, a piano and keyboard. It's very easy to vary the frequency, but they're complex and costly, so we don't want too many of them. But what do we want? We want to play notes at known frequencies, so we need an oscillator. Uh, from a piano-like keyboard, because it's a very familiar interface, uh, and we can put switches behind each key to, to give us discrete control steps over a wide frequency range uh, with some interesting waveforms, and we want it to stay in tune long enough to play a piece of music. And this circuit here, this is one of the early Moog oscillators. This, I think, is from the 901B Moog oscillator. And it's really quite simple, if I can identify, if we can see through the complexity and, and extract the simplicity. So down, as uh, I can, uh, point options. Yeah, let's go for highlighter. So down here, we have a current flowing from some other part of circuit. This then charges one of these capacitors down here. So the voltage slowly rises. This device here is a called a unijunction transistor, and at some threshold, it turns on, discharges the capacitor, then turns off. So what we get coming out of this is a sawtooth, and that gets buffered and appears here. We then take that sawtooth and run it through a comparator, and that gives us a pulse output. We then run it through another circuit here, together with some more capacitors, and that gives us a triangular output. And then, furthermore, because as I said, we're interested in, in interesting waveforms, we use a diode function generator to give us something that looks like a pretty good approximation to a sign. So this has all the fundamental elements of um, an oscillator that we can use for making interesting sounds. But how do we control it? So I said earlier that we want a uh, we like to use a piano keyboard, it's a very familiar interface. Um, we, uh, we're running at, um, it's, it's very, very cheap to make, so we just need one resistor per key, but introduces a new problem. We need to do some maths. The oscillators, as described, are linear in terms of control current or voltage, but musical scale is exponential, octaves double frequency. So Bob Moog built um, what is known as a log amp, or the reverse of a log amp. And this, is, this uses a transistor wrapped around an op amp and gives us what we want. And the reason it works is transistors are actually tiny little slide rules. They have this amazing property, um, described or uh, approximated by the, the Ebers-Moll equation, where the collector current is proportional to the, the base emitter voltage. There's a few other things in here that we need to worry about, but fundamentally, it's a slide rule. But notice that we have T in the equation. The T is temperature. 
and the IS, which is the reverse saturation current, also changes the temperature. So we need to fix this. We need to we, we want a stable oscillator. We don't want it to drift as the oscillator uh, warms up or cools down. So we're going to do a two-pronged attack. First thing we're going to use is we're going to use two transistors. Um, and we're going to make sure they're at the same temperature. So we then take the difference in the current. So that cancels out IS. Um, subtract one from the other, and the common term disappears. But we've still got the T go back in this slide. We've still got well, so, so we've 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 dealt with IS, but we've still got T in the equation. And we solved that by using um, the now infamous Tempco resistor, which was very, very popular um, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, moving into the 80s a bit. Um, they're much harder to get these days, but uh, that's very much the technology of the time. And so if we see how Moog um, went about this, this is the front end to that earlier um, Moog 901 oscillator. So on the left, you've got essentially an adder. It combines a number of control voltages coming in here from keyboards or other in interfaces. We might add a fixed control voltage to shift it up and down by um, a few notes. Then we sum it all together and we provide a control into this circuit here. These two transistors, that's your exponential converter with the temperature compensation. These diodes here, they uh, compensate further for temperature. So as it heats up and cools down, these diodes change at the same, roughly at the same rate as the transistor junctions and compensate to, um, to some extent. And then we take, we, we work out the difference in the current and pass that on to the oscillator circuit we saw on a slide, on a couple of slides ago. Now this is certainly a very popular approach. It's been used many, many times, copied in countless um, synthesizer circuits. There is another way of compensating for temperature, and that is by having no temperature at all, or rather having no change in temperature. So once you've tuned your oscillator, it stays where it is. And that's done, and that was done at the time. Um, Don Buchler used it uh, in his 200 series um, VCOs with this little chap, a, a UA726, I think from Fairchild. And what this has is the two transistors that we had before wrapped inside an oven. So there's a little heating element and a little temperature sensor, and you add an op out to servo. And so you maintain these transistors at a constant high temperature. And so if the environment is heating up or cooling down, you don't care because these uh, expo transistors are kept at a constant temperature. So the oscillator will not drift much. So if we put these things together into something a bit more modern, uh, this schematic here, this is from the ASM1, the, the ASM1 uh, BCO that was developed by Gene Stopp and Magnus Danielson. And you can see it's got all of the elements that we've been talking about in a more in a slightly more modern um, flavor. We've got the input mixer now based around an op amp because op amps are much ch cheaper now. We've got our little tempo resistor here compensating for the T in the in the uh, exponential function. We've got our two transistors here, and in this case, these are actually two two individual transistors on the same piece of silicon. This is a, a MATO two. Um, I don't think they're I, th I think they're long gone now, but and then over here we have our capacitor, which charges from the current that passes down here, and this off amp buffers things. And at some point, this circuit down here, so UJTs have gone the way of the valves. Um, I don't really get them anymore. Um, but at some point, this little circuit here will trigger, and it will turn on this transistor, which resets the capacitor. And the cycle starts again. And so we had our oscillator giving us a lovely sawtooth coming out at the end. And this did, did design um, has been used many, many times. If you look in a lot of uh, modular synthesizers, both commercially and uh, DIY, you will see this structure. 
And discrete VCOs were around for many, many years, um, using transistors, op amps, diodes, resistors, and capacitors. And I've got some commercial examples here. You may be familiar with them. The mini Moog. This had three of those discrete oscillators uh, that gave you um, gave the user a, a, a rich sound, able to layer multiple oscillators, either slightly detune them or wildly detune them. Or you could use one of them as a low frequency oscillator. The Oberheim SEM, uh, the synthesizer expander module. Again, it's the classic um, so, uh, op amp integrator with reset, giving your sawtooth, and then you can shape it into other waveforms. And finally, uh, not quite finally, and then we've got the EMI modulator. The earlier versions of this, they had discrete VCOs. Later versions went on to use um, integrated oscillators, which we'll see shortly. And finally, the as I said, the the, the Buchler 200 series used discrete VCOs with ovenized uh, expo transistors to ensure stability. So discrete oscillators are brilliant. They got the, uh, the technology going, but they're quite expensive. So companies started looking at ways of integrating, because that is a good way of reducing costs. Yamaha, um, very much um, into, and you can certainly see here, the low cost. Um, and they integrated their VCOs into these modules. You can see we've got a potted VCO module over here. Um, and also ARP, they did a lot of module potting. Um, it has advantages if you're making an oscillator. By surrounding the electronics in um, epoxy goop, it tends to keep the temperature the, the same. So thermal matching is uh, exceptional, but is very, very good. Far better than just having the components um, open to air um, on a, a circuit board. But then in the 1970s, silicon technology really started coming down in price. And two main, I would probably say the only companies address the electronic music market with silicon. And these were SSM and CEM, both in California. So let's start with SSM. They're, they're, the SSM 2030 integrated pretty much what we've already seen. You've got your two transistors down here for um, your x spectral inverter, got a current mirror here to flip the sign of the current. We've got the capacitor here that charges up, and we buffer that voltage, and that gives us our sawtooth output. If we then follow it around uh, to a comparator, which triggers at a set point and operates the one shot that then turns on the transistor, that discharges the capacitor and puts us back to the start of the cycle, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that gives us our nice sawtooth oscillator. We then have a comparator for giving our pulse output, and a buffer circuit here for giving us a triangle. And we can do various things like hard and soft sync by moving the thresholds at which this oscillator resets. And the other competitor was Curtis Electro Music with their SEM3340. This is a different take. This is a triangle core oscillator. And it's more complex, as you can uh, see by the diagram. There's a lot more going on here. We've got current mirrors, buffers, um, and all sorts of things going on. But fundamentally, it integrates the VCO onto a single piece of silicon. And with a Tempco generator and precision multiplier, um, it was very, very stable. And both of these parts uh, really hit the market when we got onto this trap, the Profit 5. Early versions of this, I think the Rev 1 and 2 had the SSM part, and then the Rev 3 went on to the CEM part. But this synthesizer from Dave Smith at Sequential really changed the market in um, electronic music. It was polyphonic, it was analog, it was warm, it was programmable. You could store patches. You didn't have to mess around with cables, plugging them in and out, or 
you, or um, on a modular or other early um, analog integrated synthesizers like this, where you had to remember where all the knobs were, where all the, the switches were. With this one, you could call up a patch, internal electronics would root everything, store all of the settings. And so you, as well as the technology here, you had a new market of people creating patches, uh, creating sound banks, if you will. And the storage technology of the day, not quite floppy disk as my mentioned at the start, but they used tape to record um, the patches and ironically as um, as audio tones. <laughs> I think that is quite an um, interesting take on things. I just have a quick aside because I think this really sort of set the tone of what was going on from the 1970s onwards. And this interesting curiosity called Electronotes. Electronotes um, came about in the 1970s, uh, started by a chap called Bernie Hutchins, who was an academic. And it was a real newsletter. It was printed on paper. You subscribed, you paid an, an annual fee, and every so, so often, monthly or so, you get an envelope in the post with a collection of electronic circuits. And this kind of standardized um, how many um, synthesizers were designed because it gave you a cookbook. If you want to build an oscillator, this is a circuit you use. If you want to build um, an amplifier or a, a filter or a mixer or anything else, this, and it, over time it became a book. I, it's, I think it's over 3,000 pages and growing of basically how to design a synthesizer. So it had a major influence at the time. So that brings us up to today. Where are we today? Why still analog? Why am I sitting here saying, today we're talking about analog oscillators? Surely digital and software is the future. Surely. Well, yes and no. Um, there's never-ending criticism. It's too sterile. Software and is and digital is very, very precise and very, very accurate, repeatably accurate, um, which is not always what you want. And it's quite ironic that hardware engineers work hard to make analog oscillators stable, as you saw with the ovening of transistors and servo loops and all sorts of things. Um, whereas the software engineers work hard to make digital oscillators sound unstable. There's a kind of ironic symmetry there. But discrete is mostly dead. It's just too expensive. It's just too many components. If you're if you're building um, a volume product, you, you don't want to pay to have too many components stuffed onto your circuit boards. It's also reliability. It's too many components to keep in stock to build your oscillator. There are a few benefits. It has a certain mojo about it. Uh, beware of expectation bias. Um, it's also a small volume boutique synthesizer modules. Uh, and there are one or two special cases where you still want that certain um, sound um, or publicity or whatever. For, and I've got an example here of the Mo Voyager. This is Dates from 2002, as you can tell by the date that Bob Mo checked it. And again, we've got the classic structure of a uh, current coming in here, charging a capacitor. We've got this circuit here will trip a certain voltage. And we follow around, we operate this switch, which resets the capacitor, and it gives us our sawtooth. So it's still the, the sawtooth oscillator that we saw back in the Moog 901. But really, integrated is king. It's cost effective, small board area, cheap to assemble, fewer parts. And in terms of the, the working musician who just wants to get on stage or into the recording studio and record or play their tracks, they want their oscillators to be stable and in tune across the entire keyboard. And integrated onto one piece of silicon is the best way to do that. But don't forget that the VCO is just one part of, of a much bigger circuitry. We've got the filters, the amplifiers, 
and everything else that goes around it. So we really are, and, and especially in a polyphonic synthesizer, we are sensitive to the cost of every component. For example, if you've got um, a 16 voice polyphonic synthesizer and each voice has two oscillators, every sense that goes on to an, an individual oscillator adds 32 cents to the cost of the product. Might not sound much, but let's say you add a dollar. Well, now that's another $32 cost in your product. And by the time it hits the, it's the shelves, that's going to add a couple of hundred bucks to the retail price. So what do we have today? Well, Curtis Electric Music has, has, has returned. Sadly, Doug is no longer with us, but it, uh, CEM has been restarted by his family. And they've re-released uh, many of the, the back catalogue of parts. Uh, and in, in, the, in this talk, we've got the CEM3340G. Pretty much the same. Um, it's then been cloned um, by um, a number of companies, uh, Cool Audio in the guise of the V3340 and Alpha Alpha in the guise of the AS3340. And I believe the V3340 uh, is used in uh, some Behringer analog synth products like the Neutron. But what about SSM? They have been restarted. So ex-SSM team members headed up by Dan Parks have formed a company called Sound Semiconductor Inc. and SSI. And they've got a brand new VCO designed by um, a chap called Derek Bowers, who uh, was there from the start, then into uh, moved into PMI, then analog devices, and now he's come back to SSI. Again, it integrates temperature compensation but what SSI have done is go for a really tiny package, a QFN. It's only four millimeters by four millimeters. I mean, that's, it's pea-sized. It's really, really small. It's designed for modern production uh, processes and it integrates many of the support functions that we, that as a synthesizer designer, we might want to see. So we've got, uh, I'll, show you more on this on the next slide so we've got our triangle generator so it's similar to the 73340 now um this see these two blocks here those ensure a vet of the stability of this oscillator so we get the triangle outputs then we have a saw converter and a comparator for pulse wave we've integrated and they've integrated a five channel mixer and also a sine wave converter, all on one chip. And so with this one chip, you can create really powerful synthesizer voice. And in fact, that's exactly what Dave Smith did in their Take 5, um, a very unique sounding um, polyphonic analog synthesizer. Beautiful machine. So that's where we are in terms of what we have today. Um, discrete, not really, unless you want to recreate old stuff. In terms of modern stuff, sticking with analog, it's the 73340 or the SSI 2130. But what about future technologies? Where do we go from here? Well, as Neil Bohr said, uh, prediction is very, very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> Um, so this is very much a bit of crystal ball gazing, but I've picked up five directions that I think we could go. And the first is how much further we can go with integration. Then looking at cost of VCOs, stability, frequency range, and then the really wacky stuff of future architectures. So in terms of integration, sometimes it's really, really good. There are things you can do on silicon that you just can't do in discrete. You can create uh, transistor circuits where the temperature uh, mashing is amazing. S silicon is very good at um, conducting heat. Sometimes it's bad. Uh, there was a part, the CM3397, which was kind of a synthesizer voice on a chip, which is fine if you want to reduce the cost of your products, but you end up with cookie cutter every, every synth sounds kind of the same. 
it's an expensive process designing chips and silicon fabs you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop a chip but once it's developed the cost of each individual chip is really really competitive and i believe the 2130 is around about two two dollars or, or less for all of the functionality that you get in a very very tiny package so imagine the kind of density you can achieve now the cost for VC and so the cost for VCO, those discrete oscillators, very expensive. So how many can you really put into your synthesizer? And with all those components, analog components, they heat up. So you've got thermal management. Um, the Yamaha CS80, big beast gets hot. So you can see the cooling uh, ducts at the back to get rid of all that waste heat. But what if you could get the cost down? What if you could get it down to under a dollar per VCO? Then you can start to think about, well, what if you had an infinite number of VCOs? What if you had six VCOs per voice? Might give a clue what's coming next. Stability. High performance analog oscillators in uh, ICs, they are very, very stable. But now they're too good. As I said earlier, hardware engineers strive to make their oscillators stable, and software engineers strive to make their oscillators sound unstable. <laughs> and for example, uh, that, that product I showed earlier, this is sequential take five. To quote from the uh, sequentials website, for even more analog style goodness, a vintage knob and voice to voice variation for genuine vintage character. So their engineers are actually expending effort to make these stable analog oscillators sound like the far less stable analog oscillators of old. But at least these days, you can dial in how much of this vintage character, of this uh, instability and variation that you want. But how stable do I mean by stable? Well, I'm, I managed to get hold of um, the SSI 2130. In fact, uh, in this experiment, it was 2131, which I believe is the same die, just in a more DIY-friendly package. And I ran it through um, a test bench, a um, stack of HP equipment and controller PC. And as you can see, it's pretty stable. I mean, um, I've normalized this to the middle of the range at 5 volt CV. But you can see that this chip, um, over um, a wide range, over 10 octaves, its tuning is within um, uh, under a cent. And if you uh, can restrict yourself to eight octaves, it's less than half a cent. So that goes back to this comment about how these analog oscillators are too stable. So now there are interesting ideas in how do we emulate the instability of earlier synthesizers of, of earlier oscillators, what caused them to be unstable? Not just temperature. And and, uh, and I should add, um, I've, I've also done experiments with um, hair dryers and freezer spray, and this these type of parts are pretty rock stable. They, they, they don't very much by um, 20, 30, 40 degree sh shift in temperature. And what about frequency range? So for piano keyboard, we need about 1,000 to 1. That gives us about 10 octaves. Um, but orig the original oscillators were limited by the reset time. How, how, but supposing we can develop oscillators that run at higher frequencies, then we can do things like wavetables. And here's an example from Dove Audio, the WTF oscillator. We can also do things like additive synthesis with Fourier and Wavelet and Walsh, which previously has just been done in software because of maths. But now we could explore that in, in analog. And finally, architecture. So there's some interesting ideas out there. Carpa strong for um, emulating strings or pipes. Um, chaos theory, there's some interesting ideas there to do with uh, um, oscillator structures that are chaotic in nature and how we can control that. But I mentioned earlier that what if you had six oscillators, six low cost VCOs per voice? Well, if you can make those VCOs FMable, 
you could do Drowning Star FM with the oscillator algorithms that we know and love from the DX7 and its brothers. So if we've got infinite VCOs, where the cost is less than a dollar, we could have one, two or three oscillators per key. So in effect, if we, we can have for a 61 note keyboard, 61 harmonicins in a box. Um, this is not a new idea. The Korg PS3300 had this, but it was a real beast and very, very temperamental and very expensive. Another area that is, over the years, it's seen a lot of interest, and that is programmable analog. Um, there are devices called field programmable gate arrays that have millions and millions of logic gates on them, and they're brilliant for uh, digital circuits. But can we do the same with analog? And we can. So we have these devices called field programmable analog arrays, and they integrate uh, capacitors, transistors, op amps, filters, but they're mostly used for, for signal conditioning as big business there. But the performance isn't as good as discrete or dedicated analog building blocks. But it still gets interest. Uh, there's a paper published a couple of years ago by Aaron Lanterman and Jennifer Hasler in the Journal of AES, where they are looking at building voltage controlled amplifiers using field programmable analog arrays. And if you're interested in this, I do recommend going to read the paper. So I think in terms of the crystal ball gazing, that's about as far as I'm keen to go at this point. Just a bit of fun, a bit of AI generated a synthesizer at the end of the universe. And I think this is where I'm going to leave it for now. I think there's so much that can be, can be done that I can touch on some of the main areas. Um, new architectures, um, getting the cost down. If we can get the cost down of analog VCOs, there's a lot of interesting stuff we can do. And the way to do that, as I said, is integration. So I'm going to finish my talk with an and finally, because every good TV show has an and, and finally. And it's kind of Mike stole my thunder earlier, but I'm just going to, as the uh, has said, I'm the UK chair for the AS um, for, for 2024. So I'm, I'm kind of contractually obliged to say, join the AS. It's a good way to meet fellow audio engineers, networking, um, 12, 14,000 members worldwide across many audio disciplines, research, engineering, development, recording, live sound consulting, and many more. And in fact, many of the people we've talked about in tonight's uh, talk are or have been AS members. You might have noticed on those slides where I did mention a name. If they were an AS member, I would add AES member. So here we still have uh, Dave Rossum, Derek Bowers, and Tom Oberheim. They're still with us today and still designing synthesizers. Sadly, of course, um, we've lost some of the greats, Bob Moe, Don Buckler, Dave Smith, uh, Alan Perlman, and Doug Curtis. But again, all AES members and all part of the synthesizer family and brought together in the AES. And just to finally close this evening's talk, if anyone has interest in these kind of history side of, of electronic oscillators and, and let analog electronic music, um, I can strongly recommend having a look at the Bob Moog Archives, the Alan Perlman Foundation, and in Philadelphia is the Electronic Music Education and Preservation Project. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Um, just popping back up here. Um, I don't see any open questions at the moment on the net. If you do have questions, um feel free to type them into the box uh cunningly labeled q a on the bottom of your screen um i i had a, in the absence of of uh ah okay uh somebody's popped one up here uh slide download Query. yes um 
after this talk, this is being recorded, so um, it will be going on YouTube um, at some point, and slides will be made available uh, for download um, for, for those who want to read further, um, get hold of. Also, the links I put on the last page, I'll also add those to uh, the YouTube um, details so you can follow those. Another question from Tim Stinchcomb. Hi, Neil. Do I take it that the SSI 2130 is now using CMOS technology so it can be made on more modern fab lines as opposed to the older bipolar technology? Um, I believe it's still bipolar. Um, it's not, I don't, I, no, no, it, it's not a, it, yes, it, it's not a, a, a CMOS part. It is still bipolar and bipolar is still um, a viable um, technology. Uh, CMOS is the new thing, but bipolar is still used a lot. Um, you can still, you know, um, bipolar op amps are very much a thing. Um, there's a lot of technology out there. It may not, um, it may not be the latest and greatest um, stuff. It, it, it's certainly not going to be. Uh, nanometer scale, but in a lot of applications, you don't need that. Um, it's 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 just not needed. Um, what is needed is the. I mean, you you, you, you can so so for, for example, the Ebers mole equation, which is basically um, you know, you can take uh, using a transistor as a, a slide rule. You can use. Um, MOS transistors in a similarish way, but I, from what I understand, they're not quite as good as bipolar transistors for that role. So um, that's one advantage that bipolar has. Um, and generally, yeah, it's it, because it's older technology, um, it's still giving you a high level, much higher level of integration than discrete. But because it is um, older technology, it's a lot cheaper. So those prices are talking about so hundred thousand dollars or so. If you go to um, CMOS and the really small densities, um, yeah, you you, you you don't want to go there. It's into the millions. Not the question has popped up. You see those okay, Neil? Do you want me to read them out? Uh, no, I, I can go with it. So uh, Bill has asked, um, I thought that Hammond used clock motors. He was a clock maker, and they wanted uh, a synchro motor. Um, it could well be. Um, it's, I, I, whether they use clock motors, I mean, they certainly wanted the motors that were synchronous to the main frequency, because that gave them the stability. Um, slight issue was when they came to export it, because... Um, whereas in the US, the main frequency is 60 hertz. Uh, in other countries, like um, here in the UK, we have 50 hertz. So um, they had to use um, either put different motors in, or you had to get boxes to do the frequency conversion. Um, and I think you could also use those boxes to adjust the mains frequency so you can actually retune your, your Hammond organ. Um, okay. Uh, question from Alexander. Poets uh, is fascinated by this notion of chasing instability um, by analog and digital developers. So, do you think there could be an endpoint where we can dial sounds from full instability to full stability on either analog or digital setups? And what is the current thinking and research around making digital systems more warm, wobbly, and ultimately human? Um, I think that the the, the two technologies are coming at, at it from opposite ends, but ultimately trying to meet somewhere in the middle. Um, analog of old, um, and, and because of the um, technology, I mean, um, nowadays we are spoilt by high precision resistors, um, trans transistors made on modern processes that are very well matched um, and very cheap. If you go back to the 1960s and Bob Moog was starting out, um, pretty much all the transistors had to be hand-matched where they were critical because they were so variable. 
uh, resistors were five, 10%. Um, capacitors, huge tolerances. So a lot of work, a lot of cost went into um, selecting components, making them um, uh, as repeatable so that you could sell someone two or three oscillators and they'd all be in tune with each other pretty much. Um, and likewise for stability, um, you wanted to get those oscillators as stable as possible. And engineers worked hard, very hard to make them stable. Um, so I can imagine you know, um, analog stability, we can, once you get to sub one cent stability, the question is, how much further do you need to go before you achieve um, far too stable? And one could possibly argue that when you've got half a, a cent of um, tuning stability, you're probably there. Um, there's, depending on which papers you read, um, a, a lot of consensus is that around plus or minus six cents is about as close as you need to get um, for um, across a piano keyboard to sound in tune. So when you're um, an order of magnitude better than that, um, how much further do you need to go? Conversely, on the, uh, the, the software, the digital side, um, it really comes down to um, the vintage feel. Um, so a mode polysynth or sound will be unstable or vintage uh, in a different way to uh, an Oberheim or a sequential or any of the others. And so it's more a case of modeling those instabilities to give a particular flavor of instability. So you could imagine um, your digital synthesizer and you could dial in, I want a, um, a Moog Model 55 um, mono, uh, uh, modular synthesizer flavor today. And then tomorrow you might dial in, I want um, a Prophet 5 uh, Rev 1 uh, sound, or another day you might want an Oberheim's uh, eight voice, which was um, eight sems in a box with a controller and a, and a keyboard. So I think um, in terms of the um, warm, wobbly and ultimately human, um, the understanding is there, but it comes down to the cost of how much analysis do you do? How many features are people going to pay money for? Because ultimately that comes down to your your um, your return on development investment. So that answered that question. Do we have any more questions? I, I've got one in the meanwhile, Neil, which I was going to ask at the start, and I hesitate sure. to ask this, but I can't type it, by the way. Apologies. So I am just going to have to speak because the Zoom doesn't allow me to type in questions as a panellist. Um, having played nothing more sophisticated in my life than a Broadwood baby grand, which, of course, is fully polyphonic, um, you talk about things with three oscillators, how on earth do you, I mean, this is a really stupid question probably, but how on earth do you play such a thing? What happens if you press two keys at once? Do you get a completely different and higher pitched note as a result? And therefore you only could play with one finger? Um, um, that's all yeah. that work. Um, well, um, let, let's go back to um, the, uh, the, mi the Minimo, which has the oscillators, but all, th all three are used to play one note. So when you're playing your piano, um, once you get above the bass notes, you have got uh, about three strings per key. And it's because each of those three strings is tuned slightly differently, that gives you the richness of the tone from that piano. So in the same way, in the mini mode, you've got the three oscillators that you can slightly detune, or you can have one an octave uh, or a fifth or something to construct the sound that you want to play, but you can only play one note at a time. And this is called a mono synth, mono for only one note at a time. And yes, if you hold down two keys, depending on how the uh, synthesizer has been designed, it will either play the highest note or the lowest note or the last note pressed or any other <laughs> combination. Um, you then go to synthesizers like the sequential fire, uh, the uh, the um, the the uh, 
Proc of five, and that had five voices. So you could play um, a chord of up to five notes, or you could play a melody of uh, one note at a time, and you would have the decay of the of the previous four notes adding to the richness of the um, of what you are playing. Once you get to the sixth note, of course, the synthesizer then has to decide, well, I can't play six notes at the same time, so I'm going to steal the one of the past notes and use that to play the sixth note. And that's true today of, of any sort of um, polysynth where you've got limited oscillators, even um, a 16 voice polysynth. If you are um, playing notes with a long decay, you don't have to press too many notes before you start to hear note stealing because these long notes that are decaying are still oscillators that are play that you can hear. They're slowly decaying in time. And so, yes, you can play a, um, a, a, a four note chord in a few places by the time you get to the um, to, to the next chord, you might start to, to lose notes. So it's a compromise. And at the end of the day, it's an engineering compromise because oscillators cost money. And so um, and people are only going to spend so much money on a keyboard. So how many oscillators do you put in comes down to how much money do you have to be, are you meant to spend on your on your on your product? Fabulous, thank you. That answered some Room One Hundred One questions for me. And also, just there's another angle to this, um, which is brilliantly demonstrated by the Yamaha CS80, and that is the thermal limit. Um, once you've got so much analog electronics that consumes power, so you've got a big power supply feeding all these analog circuits, um, it starts to heat up, and there comes a point where you just can't get rid of the heat fast enough. Um, so on some modern analog polysynths, you actually put a little cooling fan. Um, has to be small because otherwise it gets noisy, and, and musicians don't like noisy synthesizers other than the the bleeps and bloops and wibbly sounds. Fabulous. Thank you. Any more questions before we close the talk for today? Nothing else? OK, well, I, I guess we draw uh, this talk to a close. And just to thank you, Neil, very much indeed on behalf of all of the attendees and um, also on behalf of the AES, of course, for a fascinating talk. I've really, really enjoyed that. I've learned a huge amount uh, that I didn't know about. Um, and thank you again. Um, hope everybody's enjoyed it as much as I have. I see a lot of positive comments in the chat. So thank you all for attending. Do join the AES if you're not already with us. Thank you, Neil, once again. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone, and good night.